Welcome to a World Cement Spotlight, where we look at a recently published article in World Cement and we talk about the issues that it presents to get a greater understanding of the topic and the wider subject area. I am Elizabeth Corner, Senior Editor, and I am pleased to be joined by Graham Kalwaka from Nano Precise Cycle and Sunil Vora and Saurabh Bhaknagar from KPMG. So welcome, Graham, Sunil and Saurabh. It's so lovely to talk to you today. Hello. Hi. Nice to connect. Hello, ladies. Thanks for having us. Now, today's Spotlight interview will review an article that was published in the August 2022 issue of World Cement. It was called Protecting Machines with Prediction, written by Sunil Vedula from NanoPrecise. It discusses improving operational efficiency with AI and IoT in the cement industry. And the article explains how AI and IoT can be implemented in cement manufacturing facilities in order to optimize production processes and predict machine faults before they occur. A little bit of background about our participants today. So Graham Kowalka is the Chief Commercial Officer at Nano Precise, helping commercialize predictive monitoring and maintenance solutions. Sunil Vora is partner and head of the major projects advisory at KPMG, and Sora Bagnaga is partner at KPMG, currently co-leading the industrial automation and cyber physical systems practice for India. Nano Precise Cycle is an automated AI-based predictive maintenance solution provider that facilitates early detection of small changes in machine operations well before they impact production or cause downtime. NanoPrecise specializes in the implementation of AI and industrial IoT technology for predictive asset maintenance and condition monitoring. The AI-based solution offers real-time predictive information about the genuine health and performance of industrial assets. Uh, the company is headquartered in Edmonton, Canada, and works with companies across various sectors to help drive their Industry 4.0 journey. So to begin our discussion today, let me ask you, why is increasing operational efficiency so important in the cement industry? Um, see, cement as a product has been known to be uh, a, a compositionally, you know, what they call C3S, tricalcium silicate, C2S, dicalcium silicate, um, and I think they also call it tricalcium aluminate, and maybe the fourth component of that is tetracalcium aluminophoride. It's been like this for all these years. It's not changed very much. Um, it's been the same, of course, depending upon how you processed it, uh, what grinding specificity you, you had at it. Uh, there has been some grades on it, but fundamentally cement is cement. Uh, there is a uh, very little opportunity to differentiate it on it as a product. It has a relatively simple manufacturing process compared to other commodities like maybe steel, aluminum, um, uh, maybe fertilizers. Uh, there are no specific IPs which exist for, 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 for cement and therefore it remains a product with no product differentiation. The pricing is very simply on on what I call global supply and demand, it's a commodity. The cost drivers for cement are logistics, cost of uh, raw materials like limestone, gypsum, coal, non-fuel elements, which provide calorific value. Um, and, and therefore, uh, uh, improving operational efficiency is the only way you can make that much money in this business. Uh, the added uh, benefit of having operational efficiency for cement is the fact that Operational efficiency in the cement industry is also linked to lower carbon generation, lower NOx emissions, and therefore the more efficient your operations are, not only do you make more money, but also you are more sustainable in your operations. Fantastic. Now, talking about moving the sector forward, what industry 4.0 initiatives have you seen the cement industry ad adopt so far, and how do you see that changing in the future? Yeah, I guess from my perspective, I've seen a few things, um, and then maybe the KPMG uh, team can comment as well. And I, I, I think the answer you gave, uh, Saurabh, is fantastic in terms of uh, really explaining why operational efficiency is so important in cement production. So thanks for that. Um, in Industry 4.0, really in what I've seen in cement is they're looking at quality control, that overall equipment efficiency or uptime, 
uh, they are starting to look at overall digital twins. You mentioned it's a pretty simple process. So some of that digital twin side of things is actually simpler than in many industries. Uh, so we've seen some of that. And then uh, the latest thing I've started to see is a little bit of demand prediction uh, on the AI side that they're, you know, they're interested in going, hey, should we batch produce a whole bunch of stuff and stock it? Or should we, uh, you know, because the production demand curve uh, can be very lumpy, especially with time of year, uh, that kind of thing and big projects. So I've, I've seen some companies start to look at, hey, how do we plan a little more effectively for a demand curve? And that's probably one of the most challenging uh, aspects that they're, they're toying with. Well, that's what I've seen. I don't know what KPMG uh, in your your travels, uh, anything else you've seen? Yeah, thanks, Ram. We've, we've seen the same thing. Um, uh, my observations on the more recent uh, additions to the way they are running uh, industry for initiatives in cement uh, have specifically to do with optimizing what I call the kiln circuits. Uh, the traditional kiln circuits have been optimized using what are called single input, single output loops. Uh, basically, what they were calling them as fuzzy logical export control, rules based control strategies. Uh, but now with uh, AI, you could actually uh, create what is called a, a model predictive controller, right? And model predictive control based systems are based on AI. You take time series based data, right, from the plant as it is running, create models of it, and you manipulate variables like, for example, the fuel rate, like the kin rotational speed, the mix feed rate, the force draft velocity. And the pressure of it, and and you and and the, you measure things like the burning zone temperatures, the clinker, XRDs, the backing temperatures, feed temperatures, fuel GCPs, in order to get an overall output which is maximized for the thermal capacity of the kiln, as also the quality that is needed for the clinker for further processing, and and that's become more and more pervasive. Uh, the models are becoming that much more. Uh, uh, accurate in prediction and predicting and, and digital twinning the kiln operations. And therefore the control on the kiln operations has become that much more stable and you're getting more stable and very energy efficient outputs. Yeah, it'd be interesting. And Sunil, I'd love to hear your input on that too, is how that uh, those models change over time as things wear or, you know, the age of the equipment too, because I've seen now that, you know, like a plant that has a brand new kiln is very different than one that's been around for 25 years. <laughs> Absolutely. I think my experience with, with such model predictive controllers has been that you have to undertake a model repair exercise every once in a year to account for exactly what you said, right? You said that, you know, the operating conditions have changed, the plant has gone through, undergone a wear and tear, maybe the feed compositions have changed, the source of your raw materials have changed, all those things have a fundamental shift in what was the model you're running your plant on and what you need to do now because of changing conditions that you do need to do that as a part of your discipline. Um, there are techniques in the AI, and if you use cloud computing, by the way, and I was going to come to that later in the section, it's a lot easier to do because you, you keep updating your model on a regular basis without necessarily having to do it as a once-off exercise. You just press a button and say, update my model. And, and I think those things work and there's been working fine too. That's interesting, yeah. Yeah, I like uh, what both of you are saying. Uh, but if I look at some of these cement plants in India, they've not even gone ahead and adopted this. So I'm saying there's a huge opportunity right there to jump the curve. So if uh, what you talked about, Graham, and then if Saurabh talks about bringing it to the cloud, I'm saying we can jump that whole step and go right to the cloud. We have a lot of cement capacity, for example, in India that is not uh, really exploiting this in any uh, significant way. And all of these models that you talked about. As an engineer, uh, my first job was in Larson Tubro to set up cement plants. So right from learning how cyclone works, etc. I can see that in 20 years, there's a lot of automation that is possible. And I remember when F.L. Smith worked with Larson Tubro to set, set up cement plants at that time, it, it was all, almost like what um, and Pentium 186 or 286 would be what they're using now on the cloud, right? So. There are lots, lots and lots of use cases. I think Saurabh covered an elaborate list of them. I mean, would... Yeah, so thanks a lot. You, you're absolutely right. But the one thing that I'm noticing in India specifically, uh, because logistics 
is a significant component of any cement industry. The IoT fitment on our logistics network for all cement players has undergone a dramatic change. A lot of, lot of our players, large players, have made significant investments to enhance the efficiency of their logistics fleet. Uh, so they are, they are, and that's all IoT. Basically, you're converting and getting to know and setting up large control centers for knowing where your fleet is, how far they have reached, and just getting more out of that fleet and, and making them more efficiently used. So that's uh, certainly, yeah, certainly that's that's been happening quite 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 vigorously. Yes, and it makes sense. Yeah. A lot of capital investment in the getting getting material moved around when it's just basically rock, right? <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> basically rock. Correct. The market is clearly set. So any new cement capacity, we have had the advantage of setting up many uh, cement plant projects in the country over the past few years as consultants to the o owners or the contractors. And what we're seeing is that um, they give us only 12 months or 14 months. The entire plant has to come up. So it's largely modular, well-designed, standardized projects that are getting implemented. So uh, there is a lot of pressure on the payback and therefore squeezing value out of logistics is obviously the first big advantage. I think once that gets factored into the business plans, the next attack will be on the all operational efficiencies and IoT is right there in this place to help make that happen. So good to get all of your insight there. Now let's go back to the article that was published in World Cement and that discusses using a whole host of things, AI, the IoT, acoustics, vibration, temperature, um, magnetic flux and RPM in order to optimize production processes and predict machine faults before they happen, before they occur. So perhaps you can give us a breakdown of how combining those technologies would impact production efficiency for the cement industry and, and how that would differ from conventional maintenance and conventional optimization processes. Yeah, I mean, that's really the heart of the article is when you're we were talking earlier and Sarabi, you did a, a great explanation, you know, in a commodity business, how you operate the plant and uh, use your assets, these large capital investments. You really want to keep them running uh, as, as optimally as possible. And, you know, machines, they wear, they break down, et cetera. And what our goal is at Down Precise is to help any operation, whether it be cement or any other industry, uh, really focus on the assets that are starting to have problems and give a heads up before it becomes, uh, you know, an emergency. And the we, we have about... We have thousands of pieces of equipment in various industries we're monitoring, but a big part of that is the cement industry. And we know today that there's about 8% of equipment that we're monitoring that has an actual problem of some kind. Now that could be, it may not be serious today, but it's starting to develop into something. And our goal is to take all of this fancy technology and help end users go, where do I focus my, my attention? Uh, we only have so much time people, uh, you know, which 8% of gear do I need to actually go and touch? And that, that's our goal. So that, that, that's how we're trying to impact that. Uh, and, and that comes down to, a, it, yes, we want uptime, but we also want to utilize our people and our talent because these people are in short supply, we have talent gaps all over the world, uh, different parts of the world, different challenges sometimes in terms of people, but in you know, North America, Europe, et cetera, like the talent pool is shrinking in, in a lot of ways. So, uh, you know, being able to automate a lot of the uh, inspection uh, and then focusing those people on the right things is super important as we go forward. That multimodal uh, sensing capability on an IoT device that we, we talked about in the article is really important from a perspective of, of uh, trying to get this to be accurate. So it's it's just like a human being, you know, if you only have one sense, meaning hearing, well, you're limited. So if you can see and hear, then you, ha you have an advantage. And the same thing happens in multimodal, where we can use multiple different sensing technologies to assess overall machine health. Once you have machine health and you're able to see if there's faults or not, now we start talking about the extension to that, which... Uh, in the cement industry is really important, and Saurabh, you mentioned it earlier on, is energy efficiency. So it's, it's a really simple concept of 
if your if your machinery has some kind of problem today and it's developing, it's probably less efficient from an energy perspective than if it was healthy. And the stats on uh, on that are really between five and fifteen percent uh, of energy is probably being dumped down the drain uh, due to uh, poor health of your machinery or assets. So if you invest in uh, predictive maintenance type technologies that can assess and help you focus these people, you can also get better uptime, but you can also reduce your energy costs and environmental footprints. So it's kind of a quadruple bottom line, if that makes sense. Yeah, Graham, I completely agree with you there. Just to comment what you said, a lot of the energy in the cement industry is about getting the right particle size distribution across whether it's your feedbacks to the kiln and or after the kiln clinker has been made, getting the right particle size distribution to get to the final cement that's going on. And that's extremely energy intensive. And, and, the, big, and the big part is that you don't have any standby substitutes in case that goes down. You don't have installed standbys. And, uh, and therefore, it just becomes if that machine stops, when you need a little time to get it back and running. So the point that you're making about all these crushing systems and particle size management system, as I call it, uh, uh, and their health becomes extremely critical to the overall outcome. And as you said, the energy efficiency of the plant. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, so that's the, the crux of the article, really, uh, you know, in a very condensed nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> And I wonder what you see uh, as the biggest challenges in getting value from those IoT and AI, AI projects. Uh, you know, looking back over the uh, his, history of the cement sector, uh, what have been the challenges in, in getting that value? The limited exposure that I have, I think the issues are around, uh, at, at least on this side of the world, it's around establishing a biz, business case. Right. Uh, there are a ton of use cases. We've already spoken about 15 or 20 of them on this call just now. Uh, convincing and establishing the business case would be the biggest challenge right now. Uh, also coupled with the fact that people believe that I have enough of manual oversight. So, and the oversight is not as expensive. So do I really need to invest in technology and also the worry will the technology replace the manual oversight? Are we going to be losing jobs? Are we going to be really getting money's worth? Does this technology at least work? I mean, it might have worked in a drier climate, but we are in a humid climate. Does it work there? I have already a lot of challenge on my hand managing the humidity of the clinker and crushing of it. Why should I have to worry about this additional thing? And um, is it going to be that? Um, I, I'll tell you this one very funny example. Uh, Caterpillar and few of the other heavy mining and earth moving equipment wouldn't allow us to install any devices on them because they said that if you cut a wire we're done we're not going to support you anymore so there actually had to be an external gps box and then they had only limited functionality for their boxes so when mining equipment which actually brings the dolomite out in 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 like blocks we were not able to measure uh, how many of these blocks and how many moves of the cane and how many scoops and what is the basic stuff of this type so, um, so when it comes, like we talked about the jaw crush, crushing, and, and there's an ATOX mill that uh, AFL Smith typically has for the, the initial grinding. And um, I don't know now if it has changed, but from what I learned at that time, they would not um, allow any other equipment to be installed. Um, it had to come from the OEM only. And that became a big issue also. Yeah, OEMs, warranty, cap, captive, uh, captive clients, yeah, pretty common. <laughs> Graham, I wonder if you've seen some of those uh, same challenges and, and and thought about how they can be overcome. Yeah, I mean, the business case, um, you know, I guess, I guess in overall IoT, definitely, you know, uh, I, I think you've seen, seen, you know, there's lots of buzzwords, great. Um, you know, big data, AI, machine learning, IoT, all lovely, right? But there's some stats out there from, uh, I forget which organization, I think it was Deloitte, who was looking or looking at, you know, how many AI, IoT projects or AI projects actually succeed. And it's sh shocking how many fail. And the summary of their report was oftentimes the problem was poorly defined. And this is a classic technical issue in everything is not defining the problem you're trying to solve. 
uh, routinely uh, you know leads to bad outcomes. So I'd say you know defining the problem is is one of the first steps and getting any kind of value out of any technology application, whether that be ours or IoT or you know whatever new widget you're you're talking about. So that's kind of job one, and I've seen it done badly many times. Um, I think when you get past that problem definition, and I think you know Pricket maintenance is one of one of the uh, real shining beacons of where IoT and AI is actually provide routinely provided value, and that's why you're seeing such growth in that area. Um, now you get into things like, well, did you set up a good pilot or not? And you can set up, you, you can have a well-defined problem, but a terrible pilot, <laughs> and then it sours an organization over. They go, hey, we tried that, yeah didn't didn't work well or or whatnot. So setting up a good pilot is really important and we actually have, you know, spend quite a bit of time trying to coach uh, people through do it this way. It will you, you will get a, a definitive yes no whether or not it's a good fit for your organization, but uh, at least try and set it up for success. Then you know things like uh, completely siloed applications in IoT and AI, bad idea. You know how do you how do you get past that after you get a pilot and everyone says hey yeah it was good but how do you operationalize this for real uh, and make it part of how an organization runs so that's that's another challenge we see time to time and then the last one which actually probably I should have talked about first is cultural so if an organization is just not culturally ready and I think Sunil your comments were really a good precursor to that is you know if if the whole workforce is just like, no, I, we're, we're about job protection. <laughs> or another example is if an organization really incentivizes firefighting, and, and we see this uh, all the time where you know everyone goes, hey, yeah, Tim, good job. You stayed until 4 a.m. And, and got the problem resolved. You know, the best and most efficient manufacturing operations are ones that are super boring. <laughs> You know, uh, you know the, the firefighting mode is just indicative of problematic culture in terms of how you run your operation. But, you know, people put Tim's picture up on the wall as employee of the month because he pulled out all the stops. Those are, in, you know, incentives that are ego-driven and culture that are actually opposite of what you're trying to drive. So and that, it's hard to hard to break, honestly. We use this as a joke when we say, you know, you're not going to lose your job to AI. You'll lose your job to a person who knows how to use AI and IoT. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good one. I'll have to remember that one. I haven't used that one. I'll definitely have to remember that one. There is no OEM IP on that one. You can use it freely. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know, um, Graham and Sunil, but have you experienced the fact that the cement plants, many of them in India specifically, are actually pretty old now, and there's capacity being put up now, but the older plants are not necessarily equipped with the infrastructure to, you know, get data from from machines and move them through a, a very well designed L2, L3, L4 system through technology, do analytics on it. And, and that legacy systems of what the old plants came by also becomes a big limitation for, for people to disturb operations of an existing cement plant for us, right? Um, of course, I mean, if they wanted, and if they were not concerned about job issues, then they would have done it. But <laughs> the fact is that uh, existing legacy application and infrastructure definitely poses limitations on how much AI and IoT can you do on an existing old plant of cement. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And uh, it's actually been one of our strengths. Um, in, uh, we developed a, a set piece of sensor hardware that's actually cellular enabled. So as long as you have cell coverage on the site, which is in, you know, cement plants are typically in urban areas. They're not in the middle of nowhere. Uh, or at least reasonably urban. They might be on the edges of a city, but they still often have cell coverage. So to get around that legacy part, each individual sensor is essentially its own cell device, meaning it, it requires no infrastructure. Uh, and then, you know, mix that with cloud computing, as you were mentioning, and all of a sudden it, the scalability and deployability is pretty high. 
Fantastic. I wanted to ask you about the kind of cement applications that would benefit from this focused AI and IoT solution. So what cement applications will benefit from predictive maintenance? Yeah, good question. And then, uh, yeah, KPMG guys can jump in after I do a quick, and this is really based on our experience. So this is real stuff for us. Like we actually are providing value on actual cement updates. So this is not a think tank piece really for us. Like we have, I think, I think the last count, we have close to 35 different production sites for cement that we've actually instrumented and are doing predictive maintenance. So, you know, cement mills, clinker cookers, silo top drives, uh, bucket elevators, conveyor drives, uh, you know, on the roller press side, those, there's a number of challenging pieces on the roller press that are super important to monitor. Bag houses, uh, you know, the fans uh, are, are an important part of the process too. So all of those have rotating equipment, uh, you know, oftentimes complex gearboxes, um, there's a couple of applications specifically on the roller plus that are actually quite challenging. Uh, so your average you know, predictive maintenance or sensor company can't really handle it. Uh, but all of those applications really benefit from uh, IoT predictive maintenance based monitoring uh, to keep the plant up and running. And, and we've, we've seen, I think, case studies of failures on every single one of those things I just mentioned. I think Graham said it all. Um, a large part of the cement manufacturing units is a lot of rotary devices. Uh, as I said, the particle size distribution and all the ID fans, which are drawing up air and moving materials. And those are all um, absolutely and absolutely critical to a very steady operation of a, of a cement mill. Um, if you've got those covered using predictive maintenance, predictive AI sort of solutions, um, I think you, you've got a big thing going there. Um, and uh, and I think Graham switched very nicely to explain it all, so yes. Now to close up our discussion today, uh, I wonder what you think are the upcoming technologies or the future technologies that you think will really revol revolutionize the cement industry? Um, I'll just take a quick stab at this question, please. The, the, the technologies are evolving there very rapidly are, and I, I think we are still far from having even exploited the capacity of technologies that already are in place, like AI, like IoT, like cloud computing. There's much to be done, right? Um, and uh, all of that can be evolving over a period of time. Um, and, and and as I say it in my work, you know, the, the cons combinatorial concert, as I call it, right, of these technologies together can make a huge impact. Um, um, my dream is to see a, um, a cement plant, which is uh, what I call a lights out plant. And that's eminently yeah. possible for the design of the cement kilns and cement plants that are coming through. Um, and, and that's all, all that is eminently possible. It's actually eminently possible. I mean, it's the plants are, are, are instrumented enough. And the moment you use AI and IoT and dream about having to make it a lights out plant a cement plant is eminently amenable for making that happen. Uh, and, and I think that's what the technologies are going to do to cement plants in the future. We're almost there, at least in the West European countries, but I think India is a little far, but I think it can happen one day. Yeah, and I think, you know, not necessarily, I'm going to have a couple of things, and some of them are related to IoT and some of them are not, but I think some of the interesting parts about cement is it's considered a dirty industry because of its energy intensity. And, and how much concrete and cement we produce as a human species is it's incredible. It's just outstanding. So I think there's going to be some really interesting stuff to watch in the innovation space about how to get to low carbon, uh, you know, building products. Uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, interest in that. Regardless, at the end of the day, there's still going to be something to manufacture. So it's not going to put us out of business per se. But I think that that's going to be a really interesting spot for the cement industry to contend with over the next 20 years. And some really interesting research. I think some of the the input materials, um, you know, related to concrete, you know, the the aggregates themselves is going to be an interesting space to watch. You know, the amount of actual high quality sand and in, in input material is actually shockingly small. <laughs> you know, the, all the sand in Saudi Arabia does not actually make good building products. <laughs> uh, so it'd be interesting to see that. More on the IoT and digital side, I think. Connected worker, AR, VR, uh, would be interesting to watch uh, how that 
applies. I think some of the advanced safety monitoring, uh, you know, I've seen some really interesting uh, stuff about how AI systems can uh, help monitor sites for uh, safety alerts for people to prevent incidents. So they're, they're basically watching people and machinery and avoiding collisions, for example. You know, and, and that all revolves around connected workers so that they can give heads up alerts to people before they run somebody over. Um, and, and I think those will be interesting things to watch as well. And that's not just in cement, but that's just industry wide. So it'd be, it'd be interesting to see. Uh, and then I, I think some of the connected worker side in terms of how you guide someone who you know, in a skills gap a world. Um, you know, lots of retired people in some of the Western countries, how, how you enable somebody to do a procedure they've never had training on before uh, by accessing a library of videos and, you know, walking them through it. I think that'll be interesting stuff to watch too. So it's fun. It's fun you mentioned this because we are actually developing some sample POCs for our clients to be convinced to uh, have uh, safety coaching by wearing a VR device, it's it's um, something where we, one of the clients actually asked us that if they are able to pass in the VR environment, then we'll allow them to head to the site. Right until then, they're not allowed to go there. And uh, another thing you said on predicting of safety, we had actually run a little experiment in USA for three months, where a predictive model, etc., created twelve uh, safety events that could happen in a quarter, and four actually did, and eight were false positives. And that was well liked. And now there's some particular types of construction where it happens, but I'm sure it can be applied to operations also, like exactly what you said with vehicle traffic and pedestrian traffic crossing each other. That was one part. I was thinking while sort of start off by saying lights out, one of the big ideas I think that we could try to use is when um, the viability of the plants need them to be of a particular large size. And if you're able to use data models, and we're able to really optimize the operating costs. We might be able to have a uh, much smaller scale plants, which are less damaging for the environment, but distributed well over that this is the amount of transit and the amount of diesel, et cetera, that's burned to transmit the raw materials and the finished product. And uh, that the, the total embodied car carbon because of the asset build and the asset operation would then go down. I think that could be some something to think of also. Can we make lesser cost operating claims of lesser capacity, etc., and have small package plants which run actually like mod modules that get installed on a finished foundation, produce the cement, and that's it. That the whole plant has to be packaged really well. There should not be so much of effort in building it and operating it. Any final thoughts from anyone before I wrap it up today? I just want to say thanks to the KPMG uh, team. Uh, really loved uh, having you on on uh, to talk hear your thoughts and talk about the industry. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity. It was very nice talking to all of you and to your future or audience that will be seeing this recording. I think we have set a lot of uh, goals for ourselves. We need to get back to the board and start drawing out the future. Yeah, I mean, cement so, is a, as an industry is, is a happening place for India. It's, it's one of the few places in the world where cement capacity is actually going up. Everybody else yeah. is moving away from that everywhere around the world. So it's, it's yeah. a unique country in that sense. But we need the cement. We need the growth. We need the buildings, houses, and yeah. the investment that's happening over here. And therefore, anything that can be done to further optimize uh, the operations, make them more efficient, make them more environment friendly, stock smocks and carbon emissions reduced, all works. So I think it's a very, very key and an important area for us specifically, um, uh, not just uh, well, we're consultants, but in general, as a country, as I'm speaking. So, yeah, it's a great discussion and great to learn things. Yeah, great discussion. It's been lovely listening to you all talk today. So thank you so much, Graham, Sunil and Saurav. As a reminder, you can find NanoPrecise's article, Protecting Machines with Prediction, in the August 2022 issue of World Cement, which you can access by visiting worldcement.com slash magazine. Thank you so much for watching this special Spotlight interview, and we will see you next time. Thank you.